I was given the opportunity to launch the second Nando's restaurant. So I had this, <laughs> I had this great idea. Why don't we fly pieces of chicken, of helium balloons, all over Ealing? First of all, Mark, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. We, we always say we like to find a subject that we're interested in, someone that we think is credible, and do we think it can be instructive? And that's mm. it. It isn't about money. It's not even about podcasts. It's about a curiosity about a subject that we think will be interesting. We like to think that we like a lot of things. If we get that right, then hopefully other people um, will find it interesting too. So we came across what you were doing and thought, this is, this is fascinating. And as a... As a <laughs> 25-year product marketer and done some things in my time. I've noticed that you've pulled some stunts in your time and I thought picking your brain on this subject will be fascinating. And so what, before we kick off, what would be useful is to just have a brief who you are and what you do. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, about um, some of the, the, the highlights and then dive into some of the, the, the exploratory stuff about the subject. So who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, well I, I'm still going through that uh, process of trying to discover who I am. That's yeah. a pretty big metaphysical. But actually, on the plane we're existing on at the moment, um, I'm the son of a Polish emigre, and uh, my mother was a, a Welsh shop worker, um, and I was the only child, and uh, was a spoiled only child. Uh, I'm very, I'm always very curious about how I was even uh, came to be in this place. You know, with my father had been through the. Uh, travails of the of the war. My mother had been a daughter of a of a of a of, of someone who survived the Somme. So you know, the mere fact that I'm here, considering what my father went through and what my mother went through, sure. is, is quite something. And um, basically, uh, you know, boy of my age wanted to go to university. I think you know, I thought I'd be I wanted either to be a teacher or a town and country planner. That was my aim. I think not really my passion, but someone said that should be. And basically, I screwed it all up. I discovered sex and drugs and rock and roll. I look at my own kids and how hard they worked for their university place. I just had a ball. It was the height of, <laughs> of, the, of the height of the summer of uh, 1977, and punk was exploding, and it was incredible. And I didn't really work hard, so it was um, pretty awful then. My father, who had gone on holiday, uh, my mother had stayed to support me through my exams, I went to Poland, died. Um, and that moment in my life was quite an extraordinary moment. Um, losing a father at sort of 18 yeah. um, shapes you. And uh, I thought I better, did some, I better do some growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother, God bless her, in the days when uh, ads were in um, local newspapers, spot this ad for a theatre in Swindon. Um, and uh, I applied and I got an interview. Uh, and it was a generalist at the theatre. Um, sort of on the management side. Uh, Spike Milliden describes Swindon as the, the one place in the country where they don't uh, bury their dead, they prop them up in bus shelters. Um, <laughs> yeah, I met a guy called Christian Dan Decker and, a, uh, and with a theatre when regional theatres are really powerful then, they had regional money uh, and it was a sort of a touring theatre, meaning productions coming in from right. pre-West End, post-West End, music and whatever. And I had an incredible boss who just said, go play. With theatre, and I quickly realised that, you know, to get an audience, you had to do something. You had to be in the media. And I thought, I'm going to be Malcolm McLaren in this theatre. And so I did some absolutely crazy things with regional productions. And I was getting more publicity than any of these, these productions on tour. Yeah. Uh, I was getting... I was getting the theatre into the sun, into, into the mail and whatever, onto national TV with some of my crazy ideas and stunts. And um, I then got approached by one of the producers, a guy called Paul Elliott, uh, who said, you should come to London. Uh, come to London. And there was this 21-year-old, 20, 21-year-old kid with all this power dealing with theatres. There, there was a time when you just worry about the critics. Just yeah. get the critics in. And I thought, why do you wait for someone to tell you you're good? Yeah. Let's generate some word of mouth because that's what it was all about. People talking, word of mouth. And um, and I saw the local press as my own canvas to paint my pictures. And, of course, I ran into some hiccups with pissing a few people off. Um, but you used to have to write, write a letter to the arts editor mm. of, let's say, The Guardian, The Times, for permission to call them up. 
<laughs> to have a conversation mm-hmm. about your idea. And I thought, what a, what a waste of time. I used to call them up. <laughs> used to get their numbers, you just call them up. And it was like these Oxbridge types yeah. would be completely fronted by this upstart working class kid um, who just took it to them. Yeah. Um, and the rest is history. And that's how I started. And I went and I built, uh, I then took the same principles of fame making and publicity into building a company um, that worked in, you know, for, you know, for, 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 for big shows. Yeah. Um, and then obviously to products. Um, and then I got into the internet um, and the first generation internet and doing some wild things there and built up Borkowski over the years. Um, but I, you know, without those two significant people and a lot of clients and a lot of great people around me, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here pontificating about life, death and the universe. It seems like, I don't know, you make it sound so easy, but it must have, you must have met been met with a lot of challenges. I wonder if that was like, just youthful yeah, optimism yeah, yeah. where you're just like yeah. brute force. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to do this. Cause I, 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 as you get older, perhaps that evaporates. Do you know what I mean? But like at the beginning, you just don't care. Do you? It's passion. Yeah. It's passion for something. It's belief. People I've worked with have got a passion to do something. You just can't pull that off the shelf. You talked about curiosity, curiosity and passion are the two drivers of it but also self-awareness of who you are yeah, and also an ability to kill your own ego. You've got to have an ego. Yeah. You've got to actually suppress your ego. I remember I was looking after the saw doctors um, for Warners um, back in the, back in the day. And I was on the main stage. They were really hot at the time. They were third on top of the bill in Glastonbury. Yeah. And there I was on stage with this band who were hot at the time. And there was a sea of faces in front of you. You know, just a vast, epic sea of faces. Mm-hmm. And I just thought the power that they had to entertain those people was a massive drug. Yeah. And your determination to keep hold of that, you know, and not lose it. And actually, you know, you always need to say that is your moment. That is your moment. That's a fleeting moment. Respect it, live it, and actually work hard on the next moment and the next moment. Don't take anything for granted. Don't take any relationship, any any person you meet. Some of the some of the people that are in massive positions of power in the media, mm-hmm. I knew when they were on a local newspaper or yeah. working on a hospital radio. Uh, remember, everybody comes from somewhere and respect their journey and support their journey. Mm. When people lose their job, support them, be there for them. Don't mm. think, oh, they no longer have power. And I just think it's about that's the effort you put into building relationships you know, committing to an idea and believing in something, not doing it just for the buck. Can you can you tell us a little bit about before we get it? You, you pulled some stunts, so like, just give us a couple of you know, define kind of a, a couple of great ones you did and and why they particularly worked. And then I'd like to kind of uncouple the process to try and educate the listener on 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 what makes up a publicity fund and, and where does it fit into. <laughs> PR advertising and marketing and how much do you know your customer and all the rest of it. But I'd love to just talk through, you know, Thornton's on Easter or some of the things that we've read about you. And in your words, what were they and why were they significant to you? Um, I think I touched on what I, what I learned from theatre days is that you don't have a budget, you know, and actually the success of really anything is bums on seats. And of course, if it's a critical right. success, everybody's rushing to get a seat. But a lot of plays which are a great entertainment need a lot of work. And when you don't have money for advertising or marketing, and you certainly don't have the uh, the ability of using social as we do now, you know, it was about newspapers, it was about, you know, analog media. And to get yeah. analog media, you had to make news. Mm, and you had to yeah. take it out of the culture pages and get into news. What I used to do is, is what is the story? Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, what's the story is going to titillate newspapers? What's going to, what, what's going to, what's going to capitalize it? So it was a, it was a, it was a bit like freeform jazz in a way mm-hmm. that you would look at something and you add the ingredients into it. There's a number of ingredients you need in a publicity set to make it work. My significant work in terms of art stuff was with a, was a, with a cutting edge circus company called Archaos. I mean, they, they changed the way circus existed. They were a bunch of sort of misfits from France. Uh, they came to a big circus festival in um, the South Bank, run by an amazing guy called Pierre Bidon. 
And they were really grungy. It's like Mad Max meets P.T. <laughs> Barnum. Right. Um, and actually, they went on to influence people like Cirque, Cirque du Soleil. Um, and no one knew who they were. Right. Um, but one of the things that they did was, or threatened to do, was juggle with chainsaws. So I thought, this is their motif. This yeah. is danger. You're selling, you're, you, you would go to that and actually someone would get injured in every performance. And a lot of people were misfits and travelers. They were part of the sort of traveler community, the original sort of uh, network of some of the, the raves that happened uh, in the 90s. They, you know, very much connected to that alternative traveling scene. Yeah. So I came up with the idea about juggling chainsaws, pitched them, and Piero Bidon said to me, do what you do, Mark. I have your permission. And there again, I had someone giving me the ability to go out and paint a picture. So I invented chainsaw juggling. And of course, if you think of the picture of chainsaw juggling. So what I did, I promoted the idea that this company in France were coming out and they had incredible chainsaw jugglers. Now, the show was amazing. Anybody of a certain generation saw that show change their life. Yeah. It was incredible. So, of course, what I used to do was I would phone up the authorities or get actors to phone up the authorities to say they had seen this show in France and they'd seen these people. Wasn't it danger? Now, giving any licensing authority to to come on um, and um, to come into it. They, they, so basically, we got the act that they never did, Chainsaw Juggling Band. So that became local uh, authorities banned Chainsaw Juggling. So um, the whole idea that, 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 that this then went everywhere. Um, I then saw that the, the, the conflict in Iraq was building up and I thought, let's invent a, a, um, a strongman. So I invented a strongman, an Iraqi strongman who ran away from the circus to go fight <laughs> in Iraq. So Zanuk, this fictional um, performer who went back to fight for his country, made the front page of The Sun. Um, and it was playing with the elements of what was real in the show, bringing out what the show was into the press. Get, this is what P.T. Barnum did. Yeah. This is, he never said there is nothing more. Uh, he never said there's a sucker born every moment. He said there's nothing more dismal than the fact. And what P.T. Barnum did was to take his show into some of the biggest spectacles. And it's a true story that Jumbo the Elephant, which which he which which he which is the whole story about how Jumbo the Elephant came into into Barnum Circus, but he used to take his uh, elephant to a poor sharecropper in and he would help the elephant the elephant would help the sharecropper plough the field, get rid of the horses, and can you imagine there was no Discovery Channel, no National Geographic, a whole town seeing an elephant ploughing a field. It would bring everybody to a stop. And of course, they'd want to go and see the circus. And it's true that this had huge commercial impact on some of these small towns across America. And in certain states of America to this day, it is illegal to plough a field with an elephant. <laughs> this is incredible. So that that's true? a little no fact. That's wow. absolutely true. That is incredible. So, because of how the public said. So going back to your question, Martin, it was about how do we create the essence right. of what you're about in the stunt. How do we turn that into content? How do we make that content make news? And how do we get people talking about it? And of course, controversy, celebrity, anything's titillating with sex always sort of sells. You've got those three elements. You are inspiring people, but be warned if your publicity stunt isn't as is better than the product, then that has I a think that's important for you. Yeah, so one thing we were talking about before you came on is as Martin described these stunts as like your first lever, right? So you, that's the, you're going to get all those eyes on you. And then you, ha you ha at the end of the day, the product needs to back it up. And has there ever been a time you worked on something where the product didn't back it up or you just wouldn't work with them well, anyway? <laughs> well, no, I, yeah, I've, I've done a few of those. Um, but I mean, uh, um, my, 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 I, I was given the opportunity to launch the second Nando's restaurant. <laughs> Um, so I had, this, I had this great idea. And this is where a stunt could be what I call idea porn. So a group of people get together, talk about an idea, get so excited and get so turned on about it, but don't realize that it actually is only in this little cluster. You should find that in ad agencies and marketing agencies who really don't understand the whole process. But anyway, so I, so the, 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 the guy who actually owned Anders came to me through a connection. 
And he said, we're opening up our second store. And I said, um, I said, great. I said, why don't we fly pieces of chicken of helium balloons all over Ealing, you know, and then people get their piece of chicken and can reclaim it with a, with, with a voucher for a real meal. So what I should have done is had plastic chicken, but for some reason I thought it was a bloody great idea. So I hired this agency to blow up a load of helium balloons and we flew these pieces of chicken all over. All over. And can you imagine the cows? Weeks later, there was a rat infested lump of chicken <laughs> being, being brought back. It caused a massive health warning. It was a dismal failure and a sh- idea but at least i had a crack at it but you know, i just saw the picture opportunity of the chicken breast sailing across ealing on a helium balloon it went for miles i think one of them was sort of pick, picked up on the other side of slab and um but it must have made the news people. it made like that is that bad publicity well i, I never kept nando's as a client vegetarian's nightmare and there weren't many vegetarians around there, Jack. So. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. It's raining chicken. <laughs> but what a shitty idea that was. Uh, the, the other one, the other one, the, the one thing I got was I was doing a lot of work um, in the sort of booze market and um, we were sort of brought into the Zalco Pops uh, by Carlsberg Tetley. Um, yeah. We launched the first Zalco Pops, Bacardi Breezer. But the actually, uh, the one job, they, they were developing all sorts of alcoholic, um, thing there was a there was a development of alcoholic water, there was alcoholic milk. Anyway, it was yeah. a thing called thickhead, and it was a sort of gunge in a bottle, and you drank it, and it just filled up. It was like it was a really weird, yeah, uh, unusual sort of thing. And so we came up with the idea of really hammering it as a sort of sweet meat, and uh, of course it was seen as uh, evil booze company trying to get to younger viewers and. <laughs> By the time it happened, there was such a furore over it. Three people lost their jobs. The thing was banned. And um, the guy who said, you know, give us some dangerous publicity. Um, and it was, you know, it was too much publicity. And um, <laughs> and the, it, it, he, he was, uh, uh, he went on to, to work for Gordon's Gin. when We were part of the relaunch of Gin um, yeah. at the time. And the great publicity stunt I'm, well, for Gin was that they were approached by Dennis Thatcher to have Gordon's gin at his book launch of his big autobiography. And I said, Steve, don't give it to him. I said, I'll get it on the front page of every newspaper. And of course, Gordon's gin, which is synonymous with the Tories, synonymous yeah. with the Thatcher regime, uh, which had no relevance to the young market we're trying to get at. And so we uh, we wouldn't supply Dennis Thatcher gin. And of course, I leaked that to, made the front page of the Telegraph, the Times, and it became a big talking shop about, you know, how Gin now didn't want the conversation with that older sort of Middle England audience. So mm-hmm. all the marketing messages um, about what Gordon's were trying to do, and where Gin was going, was in that one moment of seeing the publicity stunt of not giving um, Dennis Satcher his consignment of free Gin for his book launch. When you're coming up, with these ideas, do you, is it a one man show? Are you just built, do you have a formula for it that has to meet certain expectations or do you, have you just always had a sense for what's sticky? Is it something innate to you or well, would you say the, there yeah. is a formula for it? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not going to give away, I'm not going to give away my formula. Martin. Yeah, there is a formula. <laughs> I'm not going to give it away here um, for the millions of your, uh, yeah, th- there is a secret source. Um, but I think you touched on that, Jax. It is, it is, it, it is, an innate feel for what a story works. And, and to a certain extent, now, I don't really do stunts now because I think you have to be really culturally connected. And if you think of, you know, some of the stuff um, that was done recently with Little Nas and his sneakers and, yeah, and stuff right. that's going on on those platforms like Roblox and, you know, and um, it, it's, it's fascinating to me what's happening. But you have to be really close to what culturally connects. You've got to yeah. insert your messages into yeah. it. It's not going to feel like marketing. It's got to have a real sense of, um, of, 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 of picking up all these PR companies who float shit down the Thames, you know, as some sort of Ikea puts a sort of house on the Thames to generate a conversation. I guess those are also to do with creating Insta moments and creating social media activity. Mm-hmm. Um, but the purity of a good idea that sustains, you know, takes a lot of seeding, 
Um, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And of course, I'm only as good as some brilliant people I work with. But if you create a working environment, and as I learned from those people who gave me a chance, there is a completely flat structure in my organization. Everybody has a part to play in, in making it work. And yeah. everybody, in whatever they do, are part of a big team. And I'm as good as the people around me now. And I've got some excellent people, um, great thinkers, culturally connected. Um, so, you know, a lot of my work now is really on protection of people's reputations and um, helping people get out of some of dealing with the culture wars at the moment. That, that's what really turns me on. Yeah. But in terms of stunts is that they, everybody's doing a publicity stunt at the moment. And that high level of risk now you face. I mean, I would be in jail now for some of the stuff I did because of breaking laws and rules. You know, right. I remember right. with our chaos, we took two bikes, we broke down a car without any MOT in the middle of you know, Edinburgh, <laughs> the Edinburgh Festival, created a traffic jam and out of nowhere came a motorbike rider who went over the top of all these cars yeah. and they disappeared. Right. And then when, you know, I mean, the damage that was caused on that moment is was extraordinary. But, I mean, it all had to be settled, that be paid for and, and dealt with at the time. But, you know, now you'd have to think about health and safety. You have to think of so many things. And therefore, a corporate publicity stunt is impossible because it's sanitized. And that's why people like BrewDog have done so really well with it, because it's founder originated and they don't give a damn. How do you define... Um a publicity stunt to the layman, right? Because obviously, I I can see you're you're doing crisis PR now. That that's fine, and and I think people understand generally what advertising and marketing is, and people know what they've got. Publicity means you people are going to pay attention, but but how would you say what is a publicity stunt, and when is it a good time to do it? Is there a good time? A, a, a publicity stunt is is part of the process. It's never quite a standalone moment. If you haven't got a strategy around that publicity stunt and how you integrate marketing, social, or whatever, I mean, in, in some ways, a publicity stunt can create a fabulous nobody. You can right. do something and you can have a flurry of attention for a small amount of time. It is something that every, you know, it's to get your product talked about in rooms that cannot be in. It's about getting your idea across. It's about making that moment and owning. And what is exciting now, which didn't exist when I first started, is that a publicity stunt in this country or whatever can be global news in an instant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is so exciting. Sure. So therefore, you can be an absolute, you know, kicking around but you can make do it, something have that it's moment like that girl explode. that um did you read about this there was a girl that uh used gorilla glue on her hair and it became nationwide conversation and then she's now in like advertising campaigns and stuff like that and it exploded gorilla glue and it obviously it wasn't a publicity stunt in the sense that it was planned and contrived but in that now she is a somebody uh, and it also reminds me of like uh, um, there was a girl from a few years ago uh, called Bad Barbie who was famous for going on um, uh, Maury Provich, the talk show, and saying something along the lines of like "Catch me outside." She was like just like a an obstinate teenager, and she's got a huge career now just off that one moment. Um, there's so much of that now. Well, you you could argue that um, you know. Donald Trump was a publicity stunt gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe standing for the presidency was a publicity stunt. It became real. People can make things real. We're in a very divided um, world at the moment. And we're in a very complex uh, world full of micro silos, big silos. We're seeing yeah. that through fake news and through the conversations around COVID and the vax. And people migrate, can go to places that they reflect what they want to hear. Um, we've seen that sure. through, through, particularly through Brexit. So therefore, connecting all those nodes with an idea through mm-hmm. a publicity is incredibly difficult. So you tend now to be doing sometimes a great publicity stunt in a silo, which your market know about it, but truly great publicity stunt, everybody in the world knows about it. You can go to a bar in, I know, Burkina Faso, or you can go to, you know, to Ibiza, or you can go to New York, and everybody knows and talks about that, you know. And, and obviously, you've got a very big platform. If you're Michael Jackson, 
um, doing some of the stuff that, that he did, you know, when, when he was run um, by um, Jonathan Morrish and doing that enormous statue that floated down the Thames or was floated into, into the can for MIP. You know, everybody's talking about it, but now right. everybody's got a camera as well. So you've got to think about how you engage people, grow things out of it, because it's got to sustain. It's not, yeah. it, you know, my I, my first, I, I changed the PR Week Awards because no one would, no would take this sort of stuff. It was, it was not PR. Yeah. And I used to get a lot of people say, you know, so um, I, I managed to get the first sort of promotional award, which is now... You know, loads of people winning it now, but it wasn't for me. They wouldn't. They'd still be not playing these things as a award ceremony, and it was for um, it was for a show called Treasure Island, um, which is a famous Christmas show, and um, no stars in it. And there was a big panto in the Dominion, and a small producer in a small theatre, the Mermaid Theatre, had this show, and I said, "What we need is a parrot," and it was a, a long since for, forgotten actor playing it. He said, oh, we got a parrot. I said, no, no, no. You've got a parrot, but I want to get a parrot. So we did We did parrot auditions. Of yeah. Ads in the paper. Everybody turned up. It was everywhere. National news. Everyone was talking about oh, all these parrot auditions. And I knew that motor racing driver James Hunt had a parrot. So um, through a motor racing correspondent, I called James Hunt up and I said, can I hire your parrot? He said, what for? And I said, a publicity stunt. And he said, for Treasure Island? He said, yeah, sure. And I went to meet him at Wimbledon, a meet with his place. He was playing, he was uh, smoking a heat spliff and uh, and allowed me to um, hire his parrot for 400 quid in birdseed because he, he, he didn't want to, he, he had some problems with the tax man at the time. So, um, so we got James Hunt's parrot. So we announced the winner of the parrot audition was none other than James Hunt's parrot. It went everywhere. And of course, you know, it was a star. But of course, we had to unwind that because it wasn't a parrot that was going to sit on someone's shoulder through the show. So I came up with the idea that, that the idea was a parrot had bad language. So I called James up and said, look, can we fire your parrot? He said, yeah, sure. He said, could you stand up? It's got a filthy tongue. He said, no problem, a filthy beak. So we announced that James Hunt's parrot had to be fired um, because it was using expletives in a kid's yeah. show. And we reverted back to the original parrot we had. Uh, that was five <laughs> weeks of coverage. Five weeks of coverage. But that, all that is is using a bit of celebrity, a bit of news. And, of course, I think it was a Monaco Grand Prix where we chose to fire him or something like that. And, That's of course, uh, there was, it was a conversation about James and Parrot. And he called me later. He said, if I'd known the I'd get him for my bloody Parrot, I'd never give him <laughs> 500, 500 quid's worth of birdseed. But he was, a, he was a star. James Hunt was an absolute fantastic yeah. laugh yeah. and just did it because he thought it was a great laugh. And I think yeah. publicity starts have got to make people laugh too. It's got to... People who look at it have got to think, mm, this is a flyer. This isn't yeah. real. But yeah. let's go with the flow. It's a Wait, bit of a laugh. Let's have can, a bit of fun with it. Can, can, I, can I challenge that slightly? Or can I widen what you just said there? Because I totally agree. But I actually think that publicity stunts for me, just they have to be memorable. And they, more importantly, have to create conversation. <laughs> and mark, greatest marketing campaigns, they create conversation. Yeah. Right? Because whether it's social media, spoken word, print, if there's no debate, no one gives a shit. And what's interesting is the greatest marketing stories, triggered sometimes by public publicity stunts, have a great protagonist and a defendant. And they push and pull at the story and it keeps it going forever yeah, because of, of the power I mean of debate. Yeah, well, look, look at it in rock and roll terms. You know, the, the fight between the Beatles and the Rolling Stones is all between that. Yeah. You know, as a kid, I remember saying, who do you like the Stones? But that's it. What you're talking about, that conversation is word of mouth. It is about yeah. people talking about it and sustaining it. And this is a difficulty now. Everybody's filling that space because of social media. Yeah. Everybody is, what's next? What? And that allows people to get away with some of the most evil yeah, crimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, corporately. Because there's something to deflect from it, right. you know. We, we you just know, ends up I as mean, a meme. 
basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you talk about the publicity battle, you talk about the protagonist and the antagonist in 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 terms of the royal family at the moment. You know, you've yeah. got the two. You got the two. You got the two houses. It's Game of Thrones. You've yeah. got the house yeah. of William. You got the house of Harry. You got the house of Kate. You got the house of. You know, it's it and it kill, carries on because yeah. it's yeah. clickbait too. Yeah, it's got to be yeah. clickbait. How do you go from an interview like? prince andrew's interview and then how does that translate in in terms of the pr machine and the press that the fact megan and harry is the one that's inflamed so much and then prince andrew kind of just lingers and then it evaporates over there somewhere and it just kind of is that just management on their side or is it like it, or what's captured well, the public's we, we, attention do you know what i mean we, we we probably don't have time to talk about the raw publicity machine and the changes yeah you know, pre and post Diana. Um, the fact is that the, the Prince Andrew thing will never go away. I mean, he, even no. getting up and offering some eulogy for his father was sort of picked on by the scourge of, of, of Twitter who just said, you know, we don't want to hear from a paedophile. You know, that, that yeah. never goes away. Um, but th this is about the, the, the soul of what the royal family are going to be. So therefore, there are two houses fighting about what modern royalty looks like after the death of of um, Queen Elizabeth, and that's mm -hmm. going to have a seismic effect on the culture of this company, country in some ways, um, because what is the royal family to a younger generation? It's nothing. It, it, it's it's meaningless entity. Um, and so, therefore, you know, how does that institution re-energise an interest? It's a bit like an old catalogue of music, you know. Yeah. You know, just dumping it on Spotify isn't enough, you know. Um, yeah. So um, I think that, uh, that, that that's going to go on and on and on. But Certain things never go away, and any claims of abuse, particularly with children, will, will sustain. Yeah, and there's nothing you can eradicate that. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to be very careful because if you've made a mistake, it'll always come back to haunt you. Yeah, um, particularly if you've been bold enough. So therefore, you've you've, you've got to have you've got to have cojones to to go through that. Yeah, you know. Coming back to the old publicity stunt, and you know, when we think about timing, is it really better for a, a a campaign launch or, you know, a new product or a new entry to a market. I'm just wondering if there's like a sweet spot, like should, should entrepreneurs be diving into publicity stunts? So the answer to it is clearly that to hack growth quickly and you're an entrepreneur with a belief and you've got a good product and you've got a strategy, then yes, the publicity stunt, the age of sort of getting that first rung of fame is your publicity stunt, but it, it actually, it's hard to sustain it. We talked about it pretty early on. You've got to have a campaign that keeps on running, that, that actually drives. Mm -hmm. I In my talks, I put a picture of um, um, Forrest Gump running across um, the uh, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge with his beard and his baseball cap and, you know, a day he starts running. And that's what it feels like now in generating fame and running big consumer campaigns. Mm. It is running a marathon every day. There is no rest. The cadence, the resistance against you is quite phenomenal. So you can't just do one. You've got to do loads. And, you, and that's the difficulty of actually keep on churning those moments. So that's when social steps up, when you've got TikTok, you know, yeah. where you might have your you know, your CEO talking a load of, um, you know, on the clubhouse. I mean, there's loads of different channels now you can use to carry forward your message. But the idea that the relentlessness, the relentlessness that is needed at the moment to drive it is you cannot, in the old days, you could get a huge surge through a publicity stunt. It would get everybody talking about you and everybody would recognize you and, and chatting and laughing at what you did. As you as we pointed out, that's gone. The moment yeah. you've done it, it's gone. Yeah. So therefore, what's next? What's next? And therefore, as an as a as an entrepreneur, as a business holder, you've got to have some empathy with the agencies you're working with to understand how to get the best out of them. Is actually how to get can you get that whole game plan in place and sticking to it, knowing that there's going to be down times and up times. But in fact, you know, a lot of it is agency world now is just throwing so much against the wall and hoping it sticks. It's got to be more tactful than that. And I think a lot of my profession spend all their time, you know, sort of talking about great publicity stunts. The sustain are all coming up with metrics to prove that their publicity has worked. 
the ultimate thing is go into the street, talk to somebody. If they know about the brand, they know what they're doing. That for me, and whether they're buying a product, whether you can see growth, yeah, and um, those are the those are the the, the parameters. But I, I've worked with some horrendous um, people who just demand too much, who expectations are at at, at you know, and it's a case of trying to educate them in terms of all the tactics they use, and um, and some of the big ad agencies too are trying to get into this this area. And so the worst thing about the ad marketing world, they talk about themselves to themselves and they don't have enough connection with what's really happening provincially. Mm. A lot of it is London focused, New York focused. You know, we're in ghettos um, and we're, you know, we, we hang out at private members clubs and we, um, and we sup with our mates. You've got to get real with something. And that's yeah. why some of the yeah. success culturally, particularly when you're talking about rap and grime and some of the urban stuff coming through, is that people are, are knowing what their audience feel about what they're doing and they're responding to that and they're kicking it in. And sometimes controversially too, um, because people looking in have no idea of their world. And that's why you've got to be so culturally connected to your audience and to where your product fits in with that audience. The two things you said there that ring true for me is like where I think nowadays you have to have a constant stream of stunts almost to stay up. And it's it's hard to do. And it's uh, it's harder now to make noise. Um, and it, 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 it oh, almost everyone's ha everyone on social media is challenging for that that point of attention for that day. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. who's going to make the challenge that goes viral today? Who's going to say that thing that goes viral today? And I remember, like, it, it starts off in one place. I remember on social media, it used to be just World Star. That was, the, there was a channel called World Star. And it would be news if, if there was a fight that broke up on there. Or I remember when rappers back in the day would have a beef and it would be the talk for about six months, even a year. And nowadays it's just, it happens. It's a conversation dissipates and it's hard work, man. Like it's hard work, Very hard to work. keep consumers really hard attention. Work. Do you know what I mean? And, and also I tell you, on top of that, Jax, is it the budgets yeah. are getting smaller. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And therefore, because it is hard this is work. Why it, <laughs> Uh, listen, in my day, working for, say, Our Chaos in the Edinburgh Festival, um, you know, uh, people coming up at my age doing it now would have to do that job for free. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. it's shocking. But I would argue, if I can challenge back there, that I, I don't, I think what we're talking about is an integrated campaign uh, that has to stay relevant. But we, you don't actually want a series of high-profile publicity stunts because then that becomes, it falls into this other um, narrative of sensationalism and you actually want it to be grounded in something. So the reality takes over. What you want is to be relevant, right? I'm going to give you, a, I'll give you an example um, or an illustration. It, it, uh, over the years, uh, you know, I, I hate publicity, but I've done an awful lot of it in order to try and fuel some of the ideas and stuff that I've done. And, and one of them was we want to invent a bloody 3D printer. We, uh, we thought, Sh we don't want to spend a lot on PR here and, and we're not, we haven't got a big marketing campaign. So we, but we were doing something that we thought was revolution. We invented full color 3D printing. We saw the hype in the market and we thought the consumer will fight our battle because they'll demand it. So it became incredibly controversial. I, I would argue it was like Eminem. It, we were almost famous. Only, only because people wanted to talk about the story. Well, ironically, 17 months later, we didn't spend a dime on PR. It was relevant to the time we sold the company. But what was interesting was that we probably had three or four what I'd call mini publicity stunts in terms of releasing something that we knew would create a, a controversy. But the rest was answers to the campaign feeding information into the market and fortunately even though we had a lot of challenges you know we had answers uh, in that campaign but i would argue you don't you don't want to be spending a ton of money and just focusing on this you know being sensational because i think it's i think it's impossible to achieve in fact where do you know of any of any campaign 
that's had mega publicity stunts one after the other. Not even Kanye West. No, but I feel like there are other ways to stay part of conversation and in culture. Because like, it's an it doesn't necessarily campaign. have to be a publicity stunt. But right. there are things that you do that attracts publicity. So for ex- uh, because I, I was going to say that we're in the age of hype. Do you know what I'm saying? And I, 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 that I I think things being well made or things being usable are kind of like a given. The what It's the cultural value now that drives people. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, why would you buy a Range Rover? Uh, they're terrible cars, but they have a certain cultural value that makes you want to drive a Range Rover. Yeah, don't, do you don't, know what I mean? Don't, don't and, say that. <laughs> you, no, they're terrible. I love my like, Range Rover. I hate them. I feel, should, should, like, be, should be using a Range Rover in London, Martin. I hope you're not. I hope it's electric. But it's that age of hype, like, and you can do that in loads of different ways, <laughs> like how you, you generate the conversation with the 3D printer. I mean, I don't know if you have anything yeah. else to add to that, Mark. But No, I, I, no I listen, I think that it is impossible um, to actually, every, every client, every job, every idea, every innovation is different. It is different because of the personalities involved, the humanity involved, the ideas the relationships, the funding sometimes, the distribution. So I've always felt when people have said, oh, you know, when I called myself a bit of a craft shop, you know, when somebody was trying to buy my business said, you know, oh, you, you, you can't use words like craft, you know, uh, you know you've got to be, you've got to, you've got to send out signals of power and dominance. And I said, look, you know, at the end, it is. You're shaping something. Everything demands a different, yes, I tell you, key tenants, but there's so much that goes into it. And if you're at the center of it, crafting a strategy and a campaign over many months and the challenges that a business can face, particularly if it's at startup mode in terms of funding thought it was going to get and doesn't get or what it is, there's so much that goes into it. So therefore, each individual campaign needs to be handcrafted, needs to be looked at you know, in, in, in a specific way. And sometimes people come to you uh, have come to me in the past with sort of great ideas, um, fantastic product. I just think, you know what? You're not ready for this. You, you, you as a human being would be a monster to work for and you've got to move away. And, um, and no matter what, what it is, you've got to be able to actually say no. And that is the most difficult thing, particularly when you're feeding mouths and mortgages to pay and whatever. The power to say no is, is so important in the quality of your work. That, that, that's a stunning and very simple insight that's profound. I'm trying to get to a point where I think there are some really important things that define whether you, someone should think about it in this way to trigger some kind of campaign. And I'm going to throw it out there. I think that if you are smart about it as an entrepreneur or as a large corporation, you have some understanding of cultural relevance. You're resonant with your culture, right? Right. And you're hopefully not following a news cycle that's one day or two days. Let's use the European Super League, right? Because as you said, here today, gone tomorrow. The second point is you're hopefully not launching a publicity stunt that's going to hurt your brand. So you have an understanding of your brand. Hard for entrepreneurs in the beginning. And the third thing is you're hopefully going to put bums on seats. So you, you know or you're in touch with the customer you're creating, or the voice of the existing customer. If those three things are right, then you can let your idea machine keep running and come up with something. The only other thing I'd say is that for people listening or, 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 or watching, if you're, if you're not in consumerdom, if you're not as broad as possible, then I might argue that a good old-fashioned publicity stunt um, may not be the trigger for you. And there may be other conventional ways to do advertising or marketing. Uh, rather than ask you to put a formula to it, Mark, how would you like to critique that? No, I, th- I, th- I, think, I, I, think, I think you've, um, you, you've summarised that really in, in, in a very succinct sort of way. I think that you, you, you do have to think about the sort of commercial journey you're on. And you do have to think about how you sustain and how you have to have a very uh, determined focus of where you, you want to be. And obviously, you know, 
depending what it is, what you're doing, and, and, and the numbers required um, to and the burn rate that's going on, mm-hmm. um, where where do you where do you see it? Because sometimes you could harness this, and there you know there are you know the beauty of social media, particularly Instagram, you know has seen the launch of thousands of really small little businesses have grown and grown, mm-hmm. are giving right. people a lifestyle and whatever. Sure, particularly through the pandemic, yeah. they don't need to they don't need to get a big huge ad agency or PR company behind it. Um, you know, other people have found methodology of sort of expressing th- their values um, and becoming thought leaders and influencers in this sort of space. There's thousands of kids out there who've got an interesting lifestyle by by by, by using that channel as well. You know, TikTok, which I think is still maturing and, and still hasn't yep. got the sort of paid for metrics around it, is is going to morph into something very interesting. But again. It's it's an it's amazing way of, of filtering down and, 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 and it depends on the scale of which which you're going for. But yes, I mean, when you get into some of the more, you know, corporate, you know, uh, where you, you have shareholders, you have, you know, um, sort of quarterlies, your analysts to deal with, you've got to have a totally different tone. You've got to yeah. be squeaky clean. You've got to you've got to be able to face it to the markets. Interestingly, all the noise about the, the European Super League, Juventus' shares, Man United shares went through the roof. These sort of blips, you know, the money markets people are working on, the rise of things like NFTs and the hype around that. I mean, mm. people are diving in all the time at the moment. You know, yeah. there's a lot of money around at the money, but money begets money. It doesn't do much more than that in some in some occasions. So I think it's it's just a careful consideration and actually really having the time to to think and develop and having mentors within your business mm-hmm. to help you and guide you and people you can feel you can talk to, you know, good NEDs uh, that have been through, you know, the pitch battles covered in star tissue that can offer you some sort of guidance to stop you doing, you know, many of us do... Yeah, do um, you know the impossible? But a lot of us do the really bad things really, really well. And I think you've got to stop doing the wrong things well because that's easy to do and very difficult. What's to do. an example of doing the wrong thing well for you in your world? Oh God, that's a good question, James. Um, I, I I think it's um, you know you've seen some of the bigger multinational companies, you know, diving in to market, you know, in, in terms of sort of there was a, there was a sort of a, a, a whiskey brand that launched a couple of years ago that, mm-hmm. that played on sort of rape culture, you know, just to get controversy going. Um, you know, some of the some of the some of the forays into into virtue signaling has been so obviously lacking yeah, yeah. any authenticity, and we're, we're we're beginning to see greenwashing. Um, you know, I, I'm really exploring how ridiculous some of this this front facing is. You know, the, Davos is a classic example. Everybody tripping out to Davos to hang out in in one of the most expensive places in the universe on private jets to talk about climate change always struck me as being one of the dumbest concepts that ever come across here. But it's a great opportunity for people who are in smoky rooms to sort of get together. So I think that um, there's there's sort of blindness about people ticking boxes of what they should do without really having any heart and soul authenticity in making the right movements and just spending a lot of money on a campaign and I've spent a lot of time in Can Lion and 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 looked through some of the some of the stupid ideas that are awarded and you just think that it's just an ad agency going for an award. Um you know they don't really care enough um to move forward. So um I think I think those are some of the areas that I would touch on in response yeah. to your point Martin. When in your early days the theater guys they took a risk on you and, and uh um struck gold and over the years you've surrounded yourself with other smart people and what is it you look for in terms of and you talked about having mentors within your company as well what is it what are the certain f- uh, characteristics and how do you find out whether they have them that signal whether someone just has that 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 ability to discern culture and is in touch with it and is in the mix is there what is it you're looking for well, I'm looking. I'm looking for people who you know are across you know modern forms of communication now, particularly within social. I'm looking for very smart people. 
I'm looking for people who have got a very strong cultural background. I like to see people who've traveled. Yeah. Um, I like to look at young talent and give them the break that I was given. So I take a risk on people. Mm. It's instinct, I guess. Um, I like all the people I work for are very collegiate. There's no egos. Yeah. Everybody's part of a team. Um, are you going to fit into that environment? Um, but I, I, well, you know, I, you know, there we, we put out, you know, questionnaires. We ask people what they read, you know, what they connect to, you know, what their guilty pleasures, what's the last record they played, what's the last gig they went, what's the last holiday went to, what yeah, makes yeah. them, what makes their, you know, what, what they do in their private life is, is very important to me. And I don't care where you come from. I don't care where you've been. I don't care who you are. You know, I, I want to encourage that person. I'm always looking for smart people. Um, and, um, you know, I've got somebody coming for me who's, who's, uh, who's, who's from the subcontinent, who's, who's, who's really been on an incredible journey um, to get into where he is now. And he's looking for the next step. Um, and his journey is, is astonishing. So I get a lot of people telling me I, I'm more interested in where they are and what they've done uh, and what they're up against rather whether or not they got a flying first degree out of Oxford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. You know what strikes me about you, Mark, is that looking at your background and looking at what you're doing now, you could have had a, a, a rip-roaring, perhaps even more scalable career in advertising, you know, by definition. No, I couldn't. I mean, the definition, you know... Uh, Great account people in advertising um, are so close to their clients, they have to have their tongues removed from their arse surgically. <laughs> Isn't and, what you're doing uh, advertising, though? Uh, hey. in, a, in, a, in a way. Look, some of my closest mates are advertising. One of my closest friends, Trevor Beatty, who, who gave us Wonder Bra commercials and FC UK, who's yeah. now producing films. I'm involved with him. We're producing, uh, we're producing a film, Brian Epstein's Life at the moment, called Midas Man. Um, uh, you know, I've stuck with Trevor. Tony Kay, who's probably the greatest creative maverick. I mean, I could do a whole hour on stuff I've done with Tony Kay, you know, um, you know, smuggling film out for him that he's he's decided he doesn't want to give it to the ad agency, he wants to turn it into a movie. And, and some of my closest mates from advertising, you know, there's yeah. great agencies out there. Carmarama, who I think are fantastic at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Mother, who... You know, guy who worked for me gave him his one of his first jobs is now the creative director of mother hermetic berlin yeah. i'm so proud of him uh, but ultimately i like people i like the media i work in i like i like analog media i like mm. journalists i like i like I, 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 it, it, it's a passion for me and i i guess that i'd be more connected to the adventure than i have about sort of you know um, building big empires i'm not an empire builder i'm much more interested in in, in carrying on doing this, you know, as I said, I've never worked a day in my life and I'm still loving it. And the day, sound like an old football manager here, Brian Clough used to say this, is over there, I start enjoying the job, it's time to quit, you know. Um, <laughs> but I'm just attracting some really cool people to work with me and for me at the moment. And that's a thrill. That's a yeah. fantastic thrill. It's a family business. I've got my, um, I've got my son in the business now. He's, you know, he's finally come into a lot of persuasion. Um, and it's, it's great to see him, you know, taking it into different directions. I've got three or four, I've got a legacy plan going on at the moment with three or four people I see taking the business forward when, you know, I firmly croak. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's been my life and my lifestyle and it's been massively fun and, and sometimes incredibly horrible. I've had some horrible, horrible times, um, some real challenges, um, some very big betrayals in mm. my life. But, you know, that's it. You know, you learn more from that adversity than you do seeing, you know, when you're a, a, a stunt, you've been on every front page of your newspaper in the world. Can you think of a PR stunt? that you set it up, you thought, this is great, and it actually turned you into using some of that crisis PR skill set that you've got where, you know, it's not that it doesn't make money, that you're actually, you know, backpedaling and, you know, rowing right back into port. Every publicity stunt has got the danger. I mean, I did something way back, and one of the photographers uh, tipped off the police that I was doing it, and uh, there was a bunch of police waiting to arrest me, 
<laughs> and um, another nice photographer warned me that that's what the, the Scotsman wanted to do to finish me off because they were sick and tired of me. Uh, it was it the Daily Record, one of the two? So there's always a bit of thinking on your feet, and that keeps you alive. That's electricity. That keeps yeah. you buzzing because every beautiful plan will have an element that can go wrong. And sure. one of my treasured clients who it was um, was a mad um, helicopter pilot and used to pick me up and. And he was a property developer, brilliant man, uh, into environmental developments. And um, we were going for a restaurant and he landed uh, near me and I got in a helicopter. And he was literally five minutes away in a helicopter. And he was going through his massive check, you know. I said, Jez, what are you doing, mate? We're five minutes up in the air, we're down again. He said, no, Mark. He said, when I land, I go through a procedure before I take up in a procedure. Because in any part of that, that's where the little things that you don't do escalate into the into the bird falling out the air absolutely and i think that's right that's it because it's the it's detail Mm -hmm. it's that detail of execution that will always let you down it's that Mm -hmm. tiny little thing Mm -hmm. that actually pulls you away and i don't Mm -hmm. care if you've got a multi-million pound stunt going across the world to launch a new car someone can it up you know yeah. there's going to be a f- up some along the line is whether or not you've got the team of people with cool heads who've been through it who just sail through it and say okay let's move on i used to see that i used to look after noel edmonds and i used to go in when when um when i used to go into the studio and the same i saw was with, with chris evans as well is live tv was incredible to see house party with 33 million viewers watching that and you could see that he was watching all the time for what would go wrong. And he could see something over here going wrong and he'd completely redirect the entire crew over to something to give time to fix that with people barking in his ear or whatever. And that is, some people have got that ability and that experience of seeing how live TV worked and whatever really resonated in terms of how you organize yourself in such a way to make sure things don't go wrong. We, we've spoken a lot about the controversy around what you do and the the highs and lows of it. And like, I'm sure you've had some very interesting relationships with people. And I'd love to hear you talk about those long relationships, but I'm sure at some point it must've been a bit contentious at times. And one thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is like, there's a rumor that went around about your book for whoever gave you a bad review, you sent them a gift wrapped pig's anus to the journalists, all journalists that gave your book a bad review. <laughs> Is that true? No, and did it work? I'll put that in content. <laughs> yeah. um, I've, I've, al- I've always had a very um, difficult relationship with the Scottish media because of my days in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, and the Edinburgh Professor is still the most fantastic place to experiment. And, um, uh, you know, it's not what it was. And boring people say, oh, the Edinburgh Professor. It's not what it was for people like me, but it is for something for other people to take it and make it their own. And that's what's so exciting about it. But I, I pulled off a lot of hairy old stuff in, 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 in Edinburgh. So when my book came out, of course, the publisher sent it out to the Scotsman. Yeah. Now, getting a book review in the Scotsman is, is pretty good. They gave me three pages of review on the Saturday edition. So big front page of the book. Oh, this is exciting. Yeah. And they've got four critics four freaking critics right. to review my book and they hammered it they absolutely <laughs> hammered it now it got a few one or two people gave it a three-star review some people were good sharp some people didn't like it that's the way things go but four people hammering me and one in particular and i know who instigated this so i thought what would my my old famous uh, this is not my own rejection my old uh, one of my Heroes is a guy called Jim Moran. He was part publicist, part advertising man in the 40s. He did all sorts of amazing things, um, brilliant, brilliant things. And uh, he created the Arsehole Award, um, which was for, um, for, the, for the biggest arsehole in, in Hollywood, um, which was a private dinner. So I sent my then PA um, down to Smithville Market because our office was in Clerkenwell at the time. And I said, go and get me four pig's anuses. And um, and get them hermetically sealed. So she went to one of the butchers and persuaded them that it wasn't some sort of joke. And we got four old pigs' anus, four of them, hermetically sealed. And I sent it up uh, with a thank you note saying, 
Thank you um, for your nice review. I thought I'd offer this. Simple as that. Now, um, three out of the four got very angry about it. One of them sent me a very beautiful book on philosophy um, about dealing with the ups and downs in life. And I thought that's the way to deal with it. But uh, I said nothing, but I, I thought I had to make a gesture. If it had just been one bad review, I would have thought nothing of it. But four, four of the f***ers <laughs> having a go at me. I thought that is, <laughs> that is just too much. So that's what, that's what provoked the arse oh. stunt, yes. That's amazing, that story. I find it funny, maybe because they were the butt of the joke, uh, no pun intended, that they didn't find it funny. <laughs> Let me ask you about what, what, what makes a good um, creative. I'm, I, this is a, I guess I'm widening the lens here. Like, you know, it's a good question. It's, yeah, whether it's creative. PR, media, yeah. or your yeah, publicity stunt, or an advertising creative, you have to be, on the one hand, kind of analytical to be able to understand what are the data points like you quite correctly earlier said look you've got to be in touch with culture right and, and and you must you must be able to see it for what it is otherwise you can't enact the creative forces within you but um what do you have do you have to be eccentric do you have to look at things differently other than having an innate ability to analyze what drives your creativity like I, could you do you have to be a bit mad I mean, I th I'm, a, I'm eccentric, and I think it helps spur some creative um, direction in, in my process. I wonder what, if you ever looked at yourself and thought, why do you come up with this? How did, where does it come from? I, I, I think it's, um, it's background experience, and, it, and I think we touched on it a couple of times. I think it's the third time, it's curiosity. Yeah. It's actually, and that ability to daydream, sometimes the ability to stop and look out. For me, it's being very close to nature. I mean, I live out, I'm, I'm, I'm proud um, of being born and bred in Stroud. I still live there. Um, I had that ability to travel up every, to London every day. So I had an hour and a half in the train. You know, I stayed in London a lot of the time, of course, but you know, that, that journey allowed me to reflect. Um, I read every newspaper every day. Um, I'm connected to as many channels as I can, and there's too much now. Um, but being alive to the news, being alive to the cultural trends, if I can't keep up with it, getting people briefing me what it is, but it's on my own journeys, my own passions. And I think that's why perhaps I'm not doing as many stunts now, leaving it to other people to do, because, you know, you know, that, the, the, you know, the, 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 the change in cultural shift is not something I'm so on top of. Mm. Um, why should I be? Um, right. So sure. I, I, I prefer to, you know, be offering more fatherly wisdom, I guess, um, to people. But if I, if I look at people who I love, and I mentioned him before, Trevor Beattie, a friend, I mean, he is on everything. He's connected with everything. And when he looks at it, he looks at the fine detail. He mm -hmm. drives down right to the soul of an idea to what's going on. Um, Tony Kay, again, I mentioned earlier on, I mean, his life is totally surrounded by so much stuff going on in terms of art and music and film and television and culture, and whatever, just immerses himself in that to come out with a response to it. But I think above it all is this sort of the, the, the connection, you know, to, to something greater than yourself. Yes, what, yes. what does your awesome. process look like in terms of uh, bringing the idea together. So do, is it like, is have you just got a notebook that you're, when you're piecing it together, is there a process that you go through to, or is it just like, this is the idea and then you just go through the practicalities of executing it? Well, it, well it's interesting um, saying about that because um, we also work with Ecotricity and Dale Vince, who owns Forest Green, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is now infamous in terms of what he's done with that club. And uh, it was quite interesting. So I pulled together with him and his, his chief of staff yesterday. I said, let's have a quick brainstorm because, you know, Dale, you should have a response to what's going on here. It's time for you to say something. And at the end of that, I came out of it that we could have done all sorts of crazy stunts, you know, uh, around that because he's, he's, he's of that intellect. Um, but we came out of the process and decided to do nothing mm. um, because there wasn't a good enough idea in it. You know, I've been through processes where people have just sort of taken a half-assed idea and tried to make it fly, when actually the most creative part of that meeting yesterday was not to do anything, mm. um, to apply our time for doing something a lot better. Um, we're doing something else at the moment. The team of my pace are doing something else at the moment, an amazing brand 
um, called the Hidden Sea, which is its mission is to take a million, a billion plastic bottles out of the ocean. Yeah. And so um, we're, we're, we're at the very, with Australian um, company behind it, we're, we're starting to develop a campaign. So yesterday we had four or five ideas. And in, in my day, I would thought, are they going to ignite the sun or the mail or are uh, they going to pick up on BuzzFeed? Well, what are they going to do? And actually, what was interesting about the people who were developing those ideas, they were all for Insta. They are all for, mm. you know, the potential for TikTok as well. And I would have just sort of, sort of moved away from that and said, that's not mine. But it's quite interesting to see how you have to, you know, make those sort of work, bring different partners in to make that work, different influences to connect with that idea. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger jigsaw of the pieces you have to fit together than the old days, having the inspirational idea, picking up a phone to a journalist, yeah. you know, um, saying, this is a front page story, what do you think? Two, put two protagonists and antagonists together, bingo, off you go. Um, that's in the front page of, say, the Telegraph, the Guardian, and the world goes crazy. Um, now it's, it, as we said, it's a little bit more uh, precise in terms of how you knit those ideas together and make them sort of real. They live, the audiences live in different places as well. Correct. So you, you, uh, big the TikTok point. audiences are different to Instagram and Snapchat. And, you know, it's all different. And how they communicate is different. You talked about Gen Z. They have their own uh, set of things and emotions that they Values, connect with. Values, language. Yeah. And they don't care about the other stuff. Yeah. yeah. They don't care. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I want to I say that you both touched on it and we're all kind of thinking something here. And... In the day you, the day you did all this, you know, whether you might argue, say, early two thousands, nineties, or whatever, but go back today, to the eighties, or even <laughs> yeah, the yeah, the eighties, right? But I would argue the birth of digitization has done a number of things. First of all, it's created multiple, m multiple, multiple inputs to culture, and unfortunately, we live now in a fractal universe where audiences are everywhere. It used to be they swam in one pond or one lake, right? And you just decided to make a, a journey to that one lake and fish there, right? But you can't do that anymore. It's, it's that much harder. So how do you stay immersive in, 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 that, in, that, in that world? Like you said, you, it's, it's a completely different skill set now to bring those audiences together. I actually argue... I think it's a lot more complex, even though information is fast and you can get it easier. We've got too much content over multiple channels that we never had before. And we're struggling to pull back that, you know, that, that, that traditional audience. You can't think about it the same way. I don't think there is a traditional audience and I call it the splinter net. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it is, it is, it is fractional in, 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 you know, it's like throwing a bunch of iron filings up in the air and trying to magnetize them back together. Um, it's a science. Yeah. Um, I think, I think, I think really good stuff actually with help will always be really good stuff that comes to the surface. Mm -hmm. I think really stuff will disappear and evaporate very quickly. Um, and I think that, you know, we're right about the, sort of the, the, the values that go into anointing these things with the sort of infamy. But, it, you know, what it is, is that if we look back, um, and that's why I originally did the fame formula back in, uh, back in 2007, is that, you know, I was sick and tired of hearing about how people are reinventing the space. Mm. No one's reinventing the space. There is no original idea. Mm. There's a context for the idea, an originality context, but there's no original idea. And when you look back and, you know, and I spent years looking back in archives, this is without the help of Google, because many of these people weren't even on Google. Mm -hmm. And you see the most extraordinary stories. Everybody underneath it, you know, has these sort of primal, primeval longings of lusting, you know, for blokes, it's feeding, fighting, you know, you know, you've got to plug into those sort of things because those things don't change within mm. it. And therefore, what is your product's need for that, for, for that primeval, you know, that sort of in, in a beast inside of us. Um, and, and I think some of the some of the fantastic, incredible work that went on in the in the 1900s or whatever, which is the nearest reference points I can get to, many of which by women, women, women PR people, women publicists with a huge amount of power. We forget that. Um, they had a huge influence in Hollywood at the time because great PR people, great publicity people, 
use the technology of the age, mm. yeah. whether it was film, whether it was radio, whether it was a teleprinter, whether it was transportation. I mean, they beat um, the prohibition by creating the junket. A film called The Cloverfield created the junket. The junket now, which happens in all movies, not as much fun, I might add, they put, they put the stars on a train across America where booze is on the train and all the journalists came in and had a great old time. So nothing changes on that. You know, the m- mail merge was fantastic. Sending faxes to journalists was incredible. Yeah. Having a computer to text people. When our first, one of our big clients was Vodafone, and our job in 2000 was actually persuading radio stations to use text in promotions because no one was texting. <laughs> That's amazing. Can you imagine that? Yeah. It, it's incredible to look back on those things. So people see technology and see channels and see media channels as an opportunity to use it for the message. And I would argue PR people and us comms people have been the first to recognize that because they haven't had the same budgets and advertising yeah. to play with. So they've right. had to really think on their feet. As we near the end of this wonderful podcast, very interesting conversation, I would love to ask you to kind of sum up, given this is about broadly the publicity stunt what would you leave the listeners and viewers with in terms of what uh, two or three things you should do and what should you definitely not do if you want to <laughs> if you want to launch a, a, a great publicity stunt you know um don't get obsessed about what you think is a great idea stress test it with the marketplace that is going to talk about it um you know trust your gut um, th- stand, you know, take an idea, put it in your drafts and come back to it two to three days later to see if it still has the same energy for you. Nice. When you look at it, give yourself time. Don't react in the moment and plan. Think where you're going on that journey. Think about yourself and where you, where you want to be, why you're doing this. And come to terms with the fact that if you've got any success at all, it is transient. Mm-hmm. Don't live on that and also choose your friends carefully. And my father's advice to me is a, supposedly an old Polish proverb, which is, which I stand by, which is, Lord, protect me from my friends. I'll take care of my enemies. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Good advice. <laughs>